from ABC News Radio, KMET 1490 in Southern California. This is Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with your host, Tyler Jorgensen. Welcome out to the Biz Ninja Radio Show. I am Tyler Jorgensen, and today I have the pleasure of talking with Andrew and Scott from VintageElectricBikes.com. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about uh, about them, about how the business started, about how they decided when it was time as the founder to have a CEO, which I think is a huge conversation for entrepreneurs to have with themselves uh, before they get going. Um, but really, we're even going to talk about their business and, and the electric bikes that they're building that are very different from anything I had seen before. Uh, so I want to welcome out to Biz Ninja Radio, Andrew Davidge and Scott Brown. Welcome out, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Ton of fun. So tell us a little bit, give us the quick personal background, like where, where are you guys based? How'd you meet? And, uh, and then let's go into, you know, how vintage electric bikes even got started. Yeah. Go ahead, Andrew. So we're based in Santa Clara, California, you know, kind of the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, you know, Scott and I met a friend of ours introduced us and they met in a coffee shop and you know, that's really how we met. You know, we started building bikes out of my parents' garage long before I met Scott. Um, and, you know, from there, it slowly started to build. And, and uh, Scott slowly started helping us develop products on the side. And that's how really the relationship grew. So let's, let's go backwards and we'll come, uh, we'll come back to this juncture again. How, um, Andrew, why did you decide to start building bikes and why e-bikes? Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I grew up racing mountain bikes around the U.S., and so I've always been in love with bikes. Um, you know, battery technology has slowly caught up to where the motors were, and um, when I first rode an electric bike, I thought it was the coolest thing ever, but it didn't have the style that I wanted. So we built this first bike in my parents' garage, and I started riding it around town, and everyone stopped and asked me, and they said, where can I get one? And I went, well, maybe we can build some for these people, and that's really where it started. So you built something that you loved that you thought was cool and the market just started to materialize as, as you rode the bike around. Yep, exactly. That's awesome. Um, and so you guys now have uh, four main models, right? Mm -hmm. And so from, from the point you built your own bike till now, how long has that been? It's been from the very first bikes. We built the very first bike in 2013. That's not that long ago. No. <laughs> yeah. And so, and you know, kind of, you know, as much as you want to share here, like where's the business now in terms of, you know, growth and revenue and, you know, how are you guys, you know, you're still not just making them out of your garage and, you know. Right. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely not. I and mean, I think Scott can take that one. Cool. Right. So actually just going back to your initial question, um, I moved out to California from the other coast. I was in Philadelphia and I was recruited out here, uh, for a company in Scotts Valley, California, in the, in the bike industry. I've been in the oh, bike industry since 2005. And prior to that, it was a uh, motorcycle industry. So uh, there's a lot of uh, synergies there of enjoyment of automotive, uh, motorcycles, vintage cars, and that, that background. That's so cool. um, I moved out here for a different job. And like Andrew alluded to, I just said hello to a gentleman in a coffee shop that I've seen <laughs> Uh, for you know six months and it happened to be uh, the person that gave Andrew his first flush of money to make that dream he had uh, a production reality which became the tracker that's so, really cool so th those first 50 bikes was in 2013 mm -hmm. I think that we did a run of 50 yeah and uh, I started moonlighting with Andrew and uh, a couple of his partners uh, for the next two and a half three years uh, up until February of this year. So February of 2017 is when I came on board. Interesting. Total random side note is my, uh, I did my radio show live from the side of the parade, the 4th of July parade uh, in Scotts Valley in 2012. <laughs> um, oh, there you go. Yeah. So I know Scotts Valley and just kind of a random thing, like we were walking through with my family and ended up in the parade somehow. 
<laughs> and then I sat down and, uh, and did the show live. It was just kind of a funny experience, but, nice. um, so that was, that was the year before you guys started. That's crazy how fast time goes, but, yeah, um, exactly. and so you guys, that one, I love that you kind of have been involved even before you got fully involved and, you know, how has, uh, Andrew, how has having Scott and kind of a CEO mentor helped you as the founder? How has it helped me as a founder? I think that um, the biggest way it's helped is, you know, the entire company. Um, we started this company, you know, with a, a bit of a garage mindset, wanting to build 50 bikes. Um, and we grew it to a certain point and we grew it to where our skill set allowed. And now Scott coming on board, um, he's not only brought in new, fresh talent, but he's really helped everybody else's skill set grow who's already been here and been with the company. Um, you know, I think that's the best, as you could call it, mentorship there. Sure. Putting some structure behind it, getting everyone pointed in the right direction. And he has a really fantastic ability of seeing people's skill sets and seeing if they're in the right department or working towards the right thing and kind of um, giving them maybe not such a gentle nudge in the right direction. <laughs> um, you can really see the energy and the momentum in the company building with someone else steering the ship and let everyone yeah. Everybody else, you know, do what they're good at. So are you, are you a believer in that concept of what got you here won't get you there? And that sometimes it's, it's, there's a different captain for the ship at different times of the company's growth? Yeah, I think the biggest concept that I'm a believer in is surrounding yourself with people that are smarter than you and think differently, you know? Um, and exactly, it's right. What's, what got us here is not going to get us there. And cool. changing things up and trying new things is something that really excites me. That's uh, awesome. Since yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, or Scott. Since 2013, you know, Andrew started with the tracker, and then we collaborated together uh, on our cruise model, which was our second model, and then we Scrambler is, yeah. is the third model, which yeah. is built off of the tracker. Okay. And now, and now um, we've done a special edition Rod Emery project, which mm -hmm. was a limited run of 50 bikes, mm -hmm. and also. Uh, the most exciting part for me to, um, you know, professionally take a risk of going from a large public company and other large companies to a startup type of company is our new cafe bike. And that's a really, uh, a, a really world-class competitive commuter bike. And it just offers a much larger demographic uh, audience. Uh, target customers mm -hmm. and and together you know over the last three years we've been working on those together and finally this year was like all right now's the time to take the plunge so it sounds like you know i'm you know i'm an electric guy right i drive a tesla and and i, I dig this movement that's happening right now and um i think it, you kind of took that model a little bit as well where you started with a more premium product and allowed that to build up the company but it sounds like the cafe is not a budget player, but a more, uh, a, a larger, uh, mass market type of an opportunity that you can scale. Is that the goal of the company? Yeah. I mean, the way I like to look at it is, uh, the tracker something, the tracker, the scrambler, the Emory bike, those are really brand driver, brand driving products, uh, where the cafe is a volume driving product, but we don't really skimp on spec. Our, sure. our, mo with the company isn't to be uh we want to be the uh the brand that people want to step up to sure. we don't want to be the entry-level product we want to be aspirational and uh you know that's all on the quality of the product we're producing yeah and i think i think finding the really great balance especially with our new products between new function and also paying a lot of attention to form um, and that's a big thing about the cafe. I mean, all the qualities there, but the function for a lot more people, um, you know, wanting to commute on the bike is there for sure. That's cool. What's it, you know, let's get a little bit of the specs. What kind of range are you talking about with a commuter e-bike? So on the, on the cafe bike there, the cool thing about it is there's five levels of assist. So, um, like when I ride mine into work pretty much every day, I, pretty much right in in level five and doing 28 miles an hour the whole way passing cars and uh and the great thing is on the way home i can go down into level one or level two and get a really good workout on the way home um and so in level one or lo level one you're getting a 60 mile range 
And then in level five, you're getting about a 20 mile range. Okay. So yeah, for most people, you can commute pretty healthily, you know, 20 miles or so, unless they live down here by me and they're commuting like 40 miles or something. It's crazy. But right in the, um, in the, in the electric vehicle industry, that's always a tricky discussion in terms of range. So (laughs) I'm just going to want to speak to that a little more. Yeah, please. Um, it's kind of like miles per hour, uh, uh, miles per gallon in a vehicle, right? Or, or uh, it, it depends on how you're riding it, whether of you're course. uphill or downhill. But we, you know, these ranges we speak of is like a 180 pound rider on flat ground, and that's the average range you can get. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't think I've ever hit my projected range uh, in my car. I think. <laughs> I drive slightly more. I enjoy driving it. Let's just put it. Yeah, that way. if you have the pedal to the metal and you're going yeah. up the it's subject to change, yeah. right? But, yeah, but I also don't drive a lot, so it works great for me. Um, and so, you know, let's. How did you guys transition from like, hey, okay, bike in the garage, get a you know initial infusion, you make your first fifty bikes. How many bikes have you been putting out? Like, where where's that growth stick from there? You know, without getting into the details of volume, what, yeah. what I can say is since 2013, um, we have pretty much doubled our revenue year on year, and we've also doubled and, and beyond our physical space. So in 2013, we were in a 650 <laughs> square foot shop, yeah. uh, with sharing it with somebody building motorcycles and smoking cigarettes, right? Yeah. yeah. And then we, uh, the next year, we went into like the 1,200 foot square foot shop Mm -hmm. and now we're in 11,000 square foot shop so I think it was that transition from 1250 to 11,000 square feet and really when you're doubling and then beyond doubling your units or your revenue it starts being a little bit like wow this isn't a startup anymore it's becoming a small company yeah transitioning from being a hobby company to a an actual you know actual business which, you know, it looks like you guys have been really smart where you're adjusting leadership and adjusting uh, growth as that's happening. What, um, tell me a little bit about the, you know, you guys mentioned the state of the bicycle or the e-bike market, right? Like how big is this market and, um, you know, how big of a piece of the pie do you guys think you guys can go after? Right. Do you mind if I touch on something just before? Please, we absolutely. I, yeah. I just, I don't want to overlook the fact that um, I know Andrew, uh, talked a bit about me, you know, coming on board as CEO, but I just want to tip my cap to Andrew, you know, <laughs> with, with, uh, that's not an easy decision for a founder of a company to make. Okay. And, and, and I do, I do, um, I don't take that lightly, right? Because he's basically given up his baby and, uh, this has been his pride and joy for how many years. And, and I think at least I was a known entity because we kind of worked together behind the scenes for the last few years Mm -hmm. and it seemed to be the right fit. And, uh, you know, you have to sort of tip your cap to a CEO or a founder, you know, who was founder CEO and sort of relinquishing those, those roles to see that the company can grow. I, I completely agree. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought that back up because I think, um, most founders ego will get in the way of them, even if they, even if rationally they know it's the right call. Uh, and so it definitely shows a lot of business maturity, uh, on your half, on your behalf, Andrew. And and it sounds like, you know, kind of a cool opportunity that you guys had to ease into that through getting to know each other over time. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I think the most important thing for me, and I'm not saying I don't have an ego at all, but like sure. what would help my ego is building the coolest bikes and getting them out to the happiest customers on earth. And it's like, this company is right. not about me. It's about our investors, but more importantly, it's about our customers and the people that give us all their hard earned money. Cause our bikes are expensive. The value's there for sure. But, and making sure that they have the coolest vehicle they have ever ridden and purchased. And whenever they get on that bike or whenever they walk past it in the garage, they're like, this is the coolest thing I've ever bought. You know, that's the most important thing. And in order to do that and get more people on our bikes, you know, we got to bring in some different firepower. That that's the right type of ego, right? The, the ego that want that recognizes that to truly excel, it's okay to ask for help and to bring in and to grow your team. Right. And so um, what we're doing here is is that's touching on the point of you can just hear the passion coming out of Andrew about the product. And, and now he gets to focus on what he's best at and passionate about. 
where I can take on the day-to-day -day business and maybe it's not as much fun with the legal activities, you know, <laughs> and uh, the financial side of things right. and, and all the other operations, organizations that come with that. And he gets to focus on making the best product and uh, with, you know, our customers, number one. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty good synergies that way. Yeah. Cool. What's your guys' distribution model? Is everything direct to consumer? Are you guys doing, you know, multi-channel fulfillment? What, what are you guys doing? Yeah, so that's, that's the interesting part right now. We, we follow a hybrid model where we have distributors, we have dealers, and we do direct sales as well. And, and we are in an interesting position right now because there's some companies that only do direct and some people that don't do direct and are with dealers. And the state of the market is kind of in flux given the, the day of Amazon and online sales and brick and mortar is finding out if they don't make changes to their business, um, they're gonna be you know left behind. So. Um, that's something we don't have a direct answer for right now on um, where are we going to be in a year or two from now. But I do know that uh, distribution and dealers and direct are going to probably be all very important to us, but it's a matter of managing to make sure it's fair for everybody. Yeah, that's, and that is tough. You, you, and protecting, um, you know, price wars and racing to the bottom and that kind of stuff is always important. Right. I'm sure you have a pretty pretty strong uh, minimum advertised pricing policy, right? And so um, to protect that. What, uh, so yeah, let, I appreciate that. Tell me, let's kind of go back to that, just the state of the market. I mean, um, you know, if you're leaving a bigger company and you guys are, are focusing on running this uh, as, as the new opportunity or your big, what you're pushing on for the next few years, um, you know, there's probably a lot of listeners that never even considered an e-bike. Right. So how big is this market? Is it growing fast? What's happening in that space? So the electric bike market itself is, is maybe the highest growth uh, segment in the bicycle industry in the last decade. Pretty much ever, right? Right. The, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it, carbon fiber, you know, is coming to the table and that was a new technology. And, uh, you know, then the next year can be full suspension mountain bikes and then right. high end racing bikes, um, you know, the, um, so it, it changes. And, and uh, now, right now, in the past five years, the growth of the electric bike uh, market has exponentially increased. It's very large in Europe. And uh, the U.S. is always kind of adapting a little bit behind uh, the European countries. And, uh, but there is a growth in the, both the U.S. and I would say globally. Yeah, I think the, the biggest segment that I see the most value in is the ability to add these motors and these drivetrains onto bicycles is turn bicycles into true transportation. You know, someone can take their kids to school on one in a kid's seat. They can load up all their groceries. They can actually commute 25 to 40 miles and not show up to work sweaty. Um, it's really opened the market to people who haven't ridden their bike in 10 to 15 years, they get on one of these things and it's their only thing they get on unless it's raining, right? Right. Um, so it's really the true transportation market that's so exciting to us. And, uh, you know, I would love to outsell car companies with these things. Um, yeah, it really seems to be, um, there's, there really seems to be a shift, right, in, in what's kind of acceptable and socially acceptable. I think we're seeing bikes becoming more popularized in the US again, where they weren't for a long time, from at least on a professional standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it's not abnormal to see somebody show up to work in a, on a bike. Um, but like you mentioned, if you can show up on a work to work on a bike and not be all sweaty and gross, that's even better. Um, you know, you can sweat on your way home, like you said. Yeah, with bikes and electric bikes in general, the electric bikes kind of have a stigma around them. And uh, that that that's been changing. But you know, Bikes and e-bikes are kind of very geeky in a way, and that may be a perception, but that's absolutely the opposite of our objective here at Vintage Electric. We really believe in style and uh, taste. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we really pride ourselves on if you're on our bike and you take it to the coffee shop, you're going to make a friend and you're going to get smiles. Yeah. And, you know, we, we believe in that with our tracker, with our crews, with our cafe. 
Um, there is something different. They're not a bike. They're not a, they're not a via, uh, car, but there's something in between. And it's really, um, you know, people appreciate so, it. Yeah. So is your, are your guys' main competitors the electric motorcycle side of things? Or, I mean, are there that many electric bike companies out there that are just all kind of growing right now? Pretty much every bicycle company, if they are not adapting to electric, they're falling behind. Fascinating. So everybody is getting in and a lot of new brands are emerging as well. So um, it's a highly competitive market and it's a, definitely a challenge for us to be able to uh, continue growing in such an environment and building a brand. Interesting. What, um, so... Andrew, what are, what's some advice that you have to, uh, you know, guys that are maybe just getting their business started in the garage, you know, for their, their net their What's your advice to them in their next year of business? My advice might be different than Scott's advice. After That's okay. You know, <laughs> up a few of my mistakes. Um, <laughs> but you know, I think it's like just doing it, you know, it's, there's so many people that talk about wanting to do something and they want to get, this perfect thing set up before they dive in. But it's like, really, I feel like rolling up your sleeves and going for it um, and finding a few good mentors along the way um, to really help guide you um, is the biggest one. Um, and listening to them. Because usually if you don't, a year later, you'll be like, I should have listened to them on that one. Um, yeah, that's amazingly true. How much energy we'll spend wanting a mentor and then quickly ignoring them. Yeah. <laughs> just doing it. That's... That's the big one and trying your hardest to pay attention to the small details and the things that you tend to push away because mm -hmm. those are always the things that sneak back up on you later on. Awesome. Same question to you, Scott. What's your advice to someone, you know, that's maybe just getting started? Maybe they're not ready. They don't have the resources yet to hire a CEO, but they've got some momentum in their business. What's your advice for them? In terms of somebody switching like I did from, from a more. No, like for the entrepreneur, for that, for that guy, that company that's just building momentum. Right. So maybe uh, they followed Andrew's advice and they just did it and they built something and they're getting some momentum going. Right. What, what's something that maybe they're forgetting in that first year of business uh, or first you know, iteration of business that would be sound advice for them? Yeah. You know, um, that's, that's a really good question for me. <laughs> What's funny is it's, I'll bet you, Scott, that it's the thing that you say all the time, right? It's probably, it's probably the thing that you're always talking about, um, you know, and it's probably second nature to you. So to come up in a question is probably kind of a, a backwards way to handle that. But no, I can, I can answer that. So yeah. I mean, my advice for entrepreneurs are, uh, first of all, you just have to really believe in the product and you have to stand by it. And uh, you really have to uh, sometimes be a little less logical, <laughs> which is completely the opposite of how I approach things. Sure. As an engineer and, uh, you know, sort of the right brain, left brain is how we operate, but you have to follow those dreams. And, and sometimes it's not all about the dollar at the very beginning, but it's about getting the product right or the idea right that you are dreaming about and get that product right. But it's also very important to think about the, the practicality of the design. And if you plan to grow it, you need to be thinking about how you can truly scale it mm -hmm. at a, because price is eventually going to become, you know, something that's important and it's not the fun parts to think about, but it's a reality of a consumer product side of things. Sure. Let's go. I, I was just talking with somebody about pricing and about how uh, the more emotion you can invoke, uh, in your process and in your product, then the less important that price becomes. Um, and so that's what I think caught my eye with what you guys have built is that Andrew, the, what you have created evokes emotion. It's, mm -hmm. they don't just see a bike, right? Every bike looks like it has a story behind it. And I think that that's just a fascinating concept. I, I think that's a, uh, you know, a real credit to you and to what, you know, your passion was from the beginning that even as you're approaching kind of the goal of mass market, you're able to still hang on to that, that passionate, uh, story kind of, um, something worth talking about. I think, I think what I want to hit on is, you know, for that entrepreneur listening is it's not a one man band 
And uh, mm -hmm. things can start out as a one man band and you can get some ego, um, but you have, to, you have to let that ego go and you have to surround yourself by a lot of talented, passionate people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I think Andrew really did a great job of from, from the onset is he found his original gangsters. He's surrounded by um, mm -hmm. some really great, passionate people that understand his vision and are willing to go to you know extreme measures to make sure that 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 idea is seen through. And I think that's something that during this transition period, I really take to heart. And uh, where we're aligned with, uh, we're really aligned with having world class staff, employees, passions, and uh, you know keeping that culture. And that's what's going to be really important to our success to keep that culture. Maybe it means more organization. Maybe it means more uh, responsibility uh, financially uh, and, you know, paying attention to the details of quality. Mm -hmm. But by keeping that original culture that was created in the garage and, and taking that to the next level is, is what's going to uh, contribute to our success. Yeah, I think all that passion that's bottled up in this warehouse in Santa Clara really flows through to our products, right? And that passion you talk about and you say that people are willing to pay a higher price for something they, they see passion in. Um, I think that's true, but also I think that sells a bike, right? So someone comes on our website, they see the bike, they see the passion, they fall in love, but it's our job that when they get the bike and they get on it, they're even more passionate about it because they're like, that was the best decision I ever made. Um, right. And passion needs to be followed up with, with quality and service and all of those things we work really hard on every day. Absolutely. I think that's great. What, um, Andrew, what's one of the like major obstacle that you faced while you were getting started and how did you overcome it? I think the biggest obstacle that we faced were the kind of business we're in. We're in manufacturing. So, you know, bike parts cost a lot of money to buy. And so figuring out how to fund that and figuring out how to, you know, make our cash flow work. That was probably the biggest thing. What do you think about last year? What comes to mind? Warranty stuff. But I think that still the hardest part of getting a business started is figuring out how to get funded. Yeah. To make sure that you're not going to outsell the inventory you have. You have stuff on the shelves ready for people to buy when you, when you get that. You know, we yeah. went on those garage. We need to make sure we had some bikes to ship to these people when they saw us. Right. Um, that's been the biggest struggle. And then making sure that the product going out the door is quality, you know, making sure that our vendors aren't you know, cheaping out on us and, you know, learning all those systems and putting them in place. The reason why I asked, the reason why I asked Andrew that question is I think he's actually not giving himself enough credit. Um, last year, you know, we're a very small company and as you start producing more and more product, quality becomes such a major driving factor and, and keeping the brand and keeping the loyalty of customers and keeping that grow. But we faced a warranty issue last year. Mm -hmm. And we made a decision as a team to stop selling product. And, and during the, wow. the, the largest selling season, the, the most critical months, we stopped. And I think that was a sign of maturity of like, okay, let's, let's put this on hold. Let's make sure we get things right. And, and then, you know, we learn yeah. a lot from those mistakes, you know. And, and that's, that's a really, uh, I think it was a turning point to the company. And, and it's made us all better for that. Yeah, I think that shows that yet you're in it for the long run, right? That you're not looking to just have one good one good holiday season, but that you want ten to twenty more after that. Yeah, we want our customers to be happy. You know what? We need those dealers, distributors to know we're going to take care of them and make things right, and and that's what we continue to do, and and we're going to keep doing that. Awesome. So, if people want to learn more about you, where do they go? VintageElectricBikes.com. <laughs> that's it, and. Uh, I think what, you can find us yeah. on Facebook and Instagram. Facebook and Instagram too. <laughs> yeah. Which, which of those platforms are you most active on? And there's so many social platforms, it's hard to manage all of them. Yeah, we do, we do a lot on Facebook and we, we probably are most active on Instagram. Okay, cool. Yep. Well, I appreciate you guys coming on. I have one question that, uh, for each of you. That's kind of my last question that I, I ask everybody because business um, for me is always about building the lifestyle that you want. It's about uh, it should never become more important than just living, right? And so um, what is one major bucket list item on both of your lists 
that you want to accomplish in the next 12 months. That could be traveling someplace crazy, doing something cool, uh, or just hitting a goal. So let's go, uh, Andrew first. What's, what's a major bucket list item you want to accomplish in the next year? A bucket list item I want to accomplish in the next year. I don't really, you know, I grew up racing mountain bikes and I, I love riding my mountain bike and my mountain bike has collected, it seems small, but my mountain bike has collected a lot of dust since we started this company and getting back on my mountain bike and uh, going and having some the old, fun yeah. with the old friends I used to ride with. That's, uh, that, I think that's it. That's a big deal. I think that's, that's a realistic and uh but really important goal to stay connected right that's outside of the company <laughs> that's good that's fine that's what i like what about you scott i would love to say it's outside of this company but my next 12 months by uh, making a transition from a, a very stable career into a more startup entrepreneurial type of partnership with andrew uh, my focus um, always is number one, my wife and uh, our new puppy, which yes. is the cutest Bernie Doodle in the world. Um, but keeping that to, uh, you know, finding a balance between work and life. And, and I really commit myself to being able to turn off and be present when I'm at home. Mm -hmm. And cool. uh, that's balanced with, I am trying to be out of stock by the end of the year and, and a very nice uh, financial path to keep the board happy and uh, to keep vintage electric bikes uh, growing and uh, our brand getting known uh, throughout the world. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys. Uh, and for everyone listening, please go check out vintageelectricbikes.com. Find them on Facebook and Instagram. Follow their growth as, uh, as Scott and Andrew sell out of everything they've got for this year and, and build more for next year. Um, yeah. Appreciate you guys listening to Biz Ninja Radio. Now go out and do something. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with Tyler Jorgensen. Please make sure to subscribe so you're first to hear new interviews and episodes. If you found this podcast to be valuable, please share it with a friend. Don't forget to visit our online dojo at bizninja.com to claim your reward for listening to the show.